Hello everyone. Welcome to Breaking Into Your Building, a hacker's guide of unauthorized access. I'm your host, Tim Roberts. <laughs> I'm Brent White. So who are these guys again? Uh, we are pen testers, senior security consultants for HD security, and we specialize in uh, physical intrusion, physical side assessment, th things like that. Uh, so our whole thing is sort of what Jason does with trying to gain access to buildings. Uh, but we also like to bring some cool tools along with us as well. Uh, so we aren't as cool as Jason, I suppose, because we require tools. So, um, yeah. Uh, so the wehackpeople.com, that's our personal blog. You can go there. Uh, some of the things we'll talk about today, bypass methods, things like that. You can see some of that information as well. Uh, something we just like to always say in our talks is not all hackers are bad. You know, uh, ha the term hacker is a little subjective, but uh, we like to think of, uh, you know, we're all hackers, right? As long as we can make something do something that it wasn't intended to do, um, to, you know, for our benefit, I guess. <laughs> yeah, and so um, with the media, again, I always ask this question, does anybody in here wear a ski mask and gloves when you're working at your computer hacking away? <laughs> no, you don't. Put your hand back. <laughs> Maybe you do if, if cool, you're the first person that's ever raised your hand. So, yeah, I mean, you see all these stupid images. I mean, what is this... I don't know. Yeah, just Google hacker, and these are the things you come up with, right? Yeah. You just look in the image search. and It's ridiculous see. stuff. And, and there's this image, too, of, like, you know, hear the word hacker. They think that you're going to rob them in the parking lot and steal their baby or something. You know, it's like, hey, we're people, too. So, Give me all your data. Uh, <laughs> and we're, we're very mature. You'll see that in our slides and things as we go. So. And something else, too. Anybody that has questions, uh, just... Raise your hand. We'll answer those as we go. We don't have to wait until the end. So Throw uh, something at us. Yeah, or if you want to heckle, that's cool too. So just really quick, just uh, unauthorized, just want to clarify that uh, this is when we are taking on the security posture or taking on, uh, on the role of a, an attacker, a potential attacker. We don't just roll up somewhere and try to break into a building because that's illegal. Uh, we have permission from that client first, obviously. So that is what we mean when we say unauthorized. So Brent was saying uh, some of the things that we do after we've established our rules of engagement and the scope of the assessment. Um, what's the goal? Where are we trying to get into? Are we trying to get into an executive suite, into a data center? Are we trying to steal a server out of the room? And you know, things are uh, discussed during the uh, kickoff call. Uh, but mostly, uh, what Brent and I focus on these days are covert uh, physical security assessments. Uh, what this means is we go in, uh, try to covertly sneak into your building, and while we're in there, we test your physical security controls too. So uh, we usually add social engineering in there, but it also it's very dynamic, and it depends on what the client is looking for and kind of the situation. Uh, as to what we choose to do. Right. Yeah, sometimes uh, we do need to interact with people, and other times we do what we can without, uh, you know, being noticed. We try to stay as gray as possible. So um, when we talk about surveillance, you know, there's so many tools out there. I just wanted to show some of these really cheap uh, things that you can get, like the spy cam pen or even a cheap little lighter uh, with a camera inside of it. Um, I mean, this stuff, if you're going to use things like this, change the housing of it because there are people that are trained to spot these things. So if you just roll in there with, you know, one of these spy pens or something, they're going to say, oh, that's not a real ink pen. Come with me. So be creative with these things. If you do need to start uh, working into more like artful concealment with some of these tools, there are a lot of other resources, and we're happy to talk to you about that as well. This is something, too, I want to add a little disclaimer. Whenever you do the rules of engagement, you're talking to the client. Make sure that you have authorization to do any kind of recording, because some of our assessments will record while we're on site. Uh, some of them, you know, of course, we take pictures of evidence and such, but uh, you need to make sure that that's clear, because there are certain laws and, and stuff you got to be compliant with. So in addition to the surveillance, uh, some of the things we do, uh, we just we like the Mavic Pro just because it's fun. Um, but we just put like a Wi-Fi, uh, like a Nano on the top. You know, that's really simple, and it was a quick thing to do. We got some industrial strength uh, Velcro tape, taped it on there. It didn't, it, it can still fly yep. really well. So, a, lot, a lot of advanced engineering went into that setup. Yes, very much so. Very highly technical. We put some uh, gaffers tape to keep the antennas from flopping around. Um, but one of the things we do is we'll just fly it over there and land on the building. You know, there are ways to 
prevent this. There are Faraday things you can put on top of your roof. A Signal lot of jammers. Things. Signal jammers and such. But this is an easy way to uh, just go and put a, set up an evil AP or, or sniff something. Or if you want to put a, even a RFID cloner, you can get close enough or something. But uh, the noise of these things is too loud to um, fly around people. Yeah, it's, it's definitely not something you want to do as your first step during reconnaissance because you're going to call attention that something is going on. Yeah, truthfully, the only time we ever use a drone is just at night when we do some reconnaissance just to see where the access points are. And, like outside the entry points and if the roof to get a good look at the roof just to do a physical assessment of that without climbing up there. Yeah, so if uh, if the certain location, if it's hard to see, you know, with cameras, if it's hard to get good photographs of of what the access controls are from on the door or where their uh, where their guard stations are, things like that, and maybe the uh, the images on Google Maps have, have been sanitized in a way that they aren't helpful. Uh, then that's when we might, you know, throw the drone up there. So, <clears throat> so what is Tim and Ben do, or are Tim and Brent doing uh, up here? Um, that is uh, just playing. Yeah, we're just playing. <laughs> uh, Software defined radio. It's awesome. It's useful for uh, places where you might go where you can perhaps snoop on security teams if they are using unencrypted radios. There are also ways to decrypt those signals as well. Uh, and or if you just want to listen to the radio, you're yeah, really bored. Yeah, uh, one night when I was playing around learning to use this, it's kind of embarrassing and funny story. I was in Dallas. I was laying in my hotel, uh, hotel, hotel bed, and I started hearing something, and it was this lady, and she was like, these diamonds are amazing. You have to buy these diamonds because they're not going to be around for long. And I was like, awesome, what is this? So I start tuning it in even more, and it ended up just being a QVC broadcast. <laughs> Where it's like, man, so close. So yeah, I'm still learning SDR. Apparently. Uh, again, going on a surveillance, uh, you can use these things. There's a lot of good places that you can use them. But if you're going into more uh, higher security areas, again, change the housing. There are some really, really good uh, versions of these things. Uh, but just the, the cheapo off the shelf things, they can work, but you can also burn yourself pretty Yeah, quick, I bought so. this, like, it was like a 1080p, um, it's called cop cam. It was like a little, a little square. It looked like a miniature visit, one of the fidget boxes or whatever. Um, battery had a micro SD on it, and I mean, it works great. It's just a little tiny square you can just kind of carry around and put yep. wherever you want to. Yep. So, uh, just real quick, we're going to go through some of this stuff really quick because we have a lot of content, but uh, there are some cases where if you're doing certain reconnaissance surveillance, you don't necessarily want to burn yourself, especially if it's a smaller team uh, and they are, you know, they, they actually are pretty legitimate with their uh, with their coverage for security cameras, things like that. Uh, there might be some cases where you need to change your appearance just for some quick surveillance. Yeah, we don't do a whole lot of this because we just kind of, uh, depending on whatever guys we come up with, if we want to pretend to be a contractor, a vendor, <coughs> a maintenance worker, yep. uh, Ebenezer Scrooge, a guy sitting right there, yeah. um, <laughs> Joe Dirt. You know, we just uh, we do a lot of we do a lot of acting too outside yeah. of this. So improv exercises and things help you to blend in. And uh, a quick side note: the picture of me as a land surveyor. Uh, you can set that up as long as you have like a high vis vest and something and something people will not pay attention to you in most areas. So you can even have that in that tripod and have a huge camera lens on there that is at, at obviously not land surveying equipment at all, taking photographs of things. But because you are positioning yourself in a certain area with a certain look, people like you're basically invisible. So and then blending in too, like uh, this just reminded me of it. But uh, carrying around the ladder, I mean, you guys see people do this online a lot. They just carry a step ladder. But uh, one of the guys on our team, um, I was the project manager, and so I had my <coughs> fake number on there. We found out who the uh, the property manager was for this building uh, that the client was renting from. Uh, I wrote up a fake letter saying that we need to, re you know, inspection because there was a recall on the sprinkler head model, blah blah blah. And then um, I gave them this letter, and he pretended to be with the property manager and he was able to just walk around in with a, a step ladder and when they asked him they looked at the letter and they called me and everything was fine and he yep. installed a rogue access point in their ceiling in their conference yep. room with his ladder so so um just quick on this i was doing an assessment a physical assessment against the hospital it was my first time with the hospital wasn't really sure what to expect and the longer i was there which was quite a few hours uh, learned that different different roles have different color scrubs. So like sanitation crew, for example, 
would wear the maroon scrubs. So I didn't have any, I didn't have any scrubs with me, but after walking around, uh, the gift shop at the, uh, hospital had every type of scrub for sale. This is, this is actually from that place. So, uh, one of the, one of the best helpful. ones to use too is the black because the phlebotomists use the black scrubs and they come and go and there's such a turnover from these guys because there's several of them taking blood from different locations and stuff. So yeah, that's pretty handy. Like a gift Yeah. And, and again, uh, if you're trying to blend in, having that gigantic lens trying to hide it with something like that, nope. Uh, you know, just, just use, Use common sense. Now, if you're somewhere and it makes sense to say your, your backstory would be taking pictures of a sporting event or national landmarks or something like that. And you're, yeah, make yourself look more like a tourist than some shady dude trying to, you know, act like he's not doing something. So. So this is just a couple of the things that we carry around in our bags, but not all the time do you need lock picks or fancy tools or bypass tools. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's just a matter of having a piece of plastic or, you know, like Jason was saying, a friendly or dopey face, uh, trying to encourage people, <laughs> <laughs> trying to, you know, talk to people. And so these, it, it's not always, hey, I need to learn, I got to be awesome. I got to be great at lock sport and I got to be a fantastic lock picker to, to get into these things. Yeah, and, and that, that talent does help. Uh, we're definitely not knocking that. There have been instances where we have needed to pick locks. Yeah, absolutely. But it, we don't use it at very much. Uh, and then, you know, these are pretty big kits. So we actually do a lot of research and work into dumbing these things down. So uh, this is my wallet. I keep several things in this very small traveler's wallet. I've got uh, a few different bypass methods and other things that I keep in here. And if you just look at it, it just looks like a flat wallet. Yeah. So, um, also, this is a neat little tool that uh, Billy Boatwright had made himself. Um, and yeah, he just kind of got a, a couple of picks in there. Yeah. Uh, the tensioner is bent, but it's uh, very easy to conceal yeah. and it was, it's easy to use. And so. I keep gaffer's tape on a lot of things. There's so many uses for gaffer's tape, and I'll show you uh, a, a sort of a, a, a way to maintain access with some gaffer's tape in a bit. Uh, again, I'm just talking about we like to take our kits and sort of dumb them down so that we can have tools that we need uh, that we can conceal. And so this is a mini laptop. It's the GPD Pro. Um, it's about this big, but it's a full working laptop. Uh, and of course the Wi-Fi pineapple and some other tools that you see there. Um, Milky Way, that's a real Milky Way. That's when you get access to a place, especially if there are armed guards, sometimes your adrenaline can, can be, you know, going as you might expect and so I, I tell people this all the time too like when i first get into a building i usually go to the bathroom yeah <laughs> and i sit go hide for a little bit. bit just to get my adrenaline and, and stuff down and i'm not as sweaty and yeah. look like i just broke in or snuck in so. so so the milky way or any type of food when you eat that it helps to naturally suppress the fight or flight response so it helps you to sort of naturally chill out and you know get your mind set uh, as Tim mentioned, uh, plastic door shims. This is, this is the tool that I personally use more than any other tool to get into places. So you can see how quick this is. Um, so this is an office to, uh, this, this office is to one of the executives there. Um, and we were showing them afterwards because we had got into the facility and then they were like, how did you get in there? And we're like, well, I mean, there's a couple different ways to do it. You have a nice window there, so we could have used the under the door tool and just, mm -hmm. you know, or we could have just used a piece of paper <laughs> or, you know, yeah. so there's just, it, it's ridiculous um, how so, secure people think things are without. Uh, right. You know, yeah. So this is a, a quick war story. And I know I'm, I'm actually going to come back to this to make sure we have time for other things. But this is another video similar to the the bypass with the plastic. Uh, this is a shove knife. Um, so you can see Tim on the other side of the door. So we're going to lock the door. Um, so we'll shut it. This is a double crash door. There's several different ways we could have bypassed this, but this particular one you'll see here in a second. Um, yeah, I use so the if you look, if you look right here, you'll see it, it just real quick. It'll lat, it'll unlatch the door and then pop open. So what's really funny about this too, though, is that they had a PTZ camera there and it was all scratched up. I mean, the dome was all, it was a mess. It was really wet. And, uh, it was weathered, you know, there's moisture in there. It's, they, they couldn't see us anyway, even if we were trying to, uh, stay under the radar even more. Yeah. And then some more things just sort of building off of the piece of plastic or, 
uh, the shove knife. You have these traveler's hooks or shrum tools, and they're super useful. They have a very slim profile, so it's a lot easier to get those in, in between uh, door frames to load doors a, a lot easier when something like the hall pass or something is too thick to go in there. Uh, another thing too, so we talk about strike plates, uh, and it's supposed to help prevent people from loading the doors, you know, because it's supposed to block the latch. Well, it's really easy to bypass those two simply by going over the top of it and pressing down, and now you're loading that door. Um, this tool, it's actually about this long and it's metal, so it looks like a, a weapon. So it looks you like have a big to be. Boomerang yeah, or, uh... if you're walking around with that in your bag somewhere like New York or something and someone questions you, it's not going to be a good day for you. So you can do something like that or a coat hanger. So if you just take the uh, bottom part of the coat hanger down here and cut that off, then you can just put a slight bend in it and you can put it in over the top of the striker plate and just still do the same thing with a coat hanger. So, uh, The latch bolt, uh, how do you prevent this? A good way to do it is just having your latch bolt set properly. Yep. So if you look at the uh, security pin uh, here on the left, just making sure that that's setting correctly. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of times, too, people that install, um, whether they're proximity, like badge readers, or they're installing these, uh, physical security controls, they're the same guys, they're, they're maintenance guys, they're wearing multiple hats. So making sure that these guys understand how to implement this, uh, this stuff, the hardware and install right. it correctly and, and securely is very important. Yeah, and, and want to mention too, this fixes and prevents all of those attacks that we just showed with the plastic, the shrum tools, the, uh, sh the shove knife, all that stuff. Those will no longer work if this pin is correctly set. That's all it takes. So there's a couple different other tools out there. Uh, the double door crash or uh, double door tool or the crash bar tool. Um, you can get this. You can make them. Uh, in fact, uh, we'll show you in the next slide one that uh, that we made. Um, but this is really easy when there's a gap. So if there's a gap, or there's no astragal or anything like that protecting. You can just shove it in the middle of the doors, turn it, and then just open. Yeah, like from the, the uh, doors the in the side. back there. Like those. Those double crash bars. Yeah. There's a big enough gap where you can actually put it through there, turn it, and open the doors. Uh, so that's that's perfect example of those doors right there. So this is one that, that I made. Um, I put heat shrink on each side to just try to prevent scratching for wooden doors, things like that. Uh, yeah, you just get the right dimensions, you bend it, make sure that it's, it's strong enough, and there you go. And it's small enough that you can put it in the small of your back or basically in a pocket or something. So, so uh, another thing is a deadbolt thumb turner, same thing. If you have a gap there and you can get to the deadbolt, um, uh, this is a neat little tool that you can turn and it, turn, it spins on the tip so it turns the, the uh, deadbolt knob. Yeah, so if you look at the slides here, I just kind of went through those. But So you put it, and these are really, really popular for retail locations. So uh, you just put it there, you insert, now you actually put it on the thumb turn, the thumb turn on the other side, and now the door's open. And again, the uh, windows are super handy. Yeah, <laughs> windows are helpful. Uh, any hotel you stay in, uh, you know, we talked, I, I wrote a couple uh, blogs on hotel room security, but um, this is always an issue. But outside of uh, that, corporate offices, uh, federal buildings, I mean, anywhere you go, there's, you find these lever handles. Um, they're easily bypassed or open with the under the door tool. Uh, I'm sure several of you guys are familiar with this. Pretty easy to make. Uh, it looks like this uh, on the right here is a video of me doing it in my hotel room uh, a little while back. And this this video creeps a lot of people out because obviously we're all staying at a hotel. This hotel actually has these handles in your room. Yeah, so you see it goes under the tool under the door, and then you just find the right handle. Here. You pull down on the string, and voila, you've bypassed their biometric uh, two-factor, multi-factor. Uh, pen and fingerprint reader and badge reader and just by putting a piece of wire with piano string under the yep. door. So how do you fix that? Super simple. Grab a hand towel, roll it up really, really tight, and this is from my room at from DEF CON last year. Uh, yeah. For for reasons. For reasons, yeah. <laughs> so just shove it in there. Now that wire cannot get under there. Uh, if you want a, a long-term solution, just get something that you can uh, put to, on the door that blocks it from going over there. Because some so. people have to have these lever handles, right? There's some that are beveled. 
uh, the little slide off so it doesn't get a good latch on. Uh, but yeah, I think the, the guy on the right there is usually what we recommend to some of our clients. Yeah, and then Tim uh, using the window, just watching it go right on the handle. So that's helpful too. Yes. And then uh, request for exit sensors. We love to bypass these things because <clears throat> if I were to make up some sort of a really good percentage, like 99% of the time, that'd probably be pretty accurate with the, with the amount of uh, sensors that we bypass. Yeah. I would say tailgating and then bypassing rec sensors are yeah. are, are two, top two ways to uh, infiltrate a building. Yeah, so they're they're usually too close to the door, and their angle is is too far down. So just by inserting canned air, spraying it, it trips the sensor because you have motion from the air, and then the canned air is colder, so there's your temperature variance. Yeah, so, so some of the uh, rag sensors are temp temperature uh, fluctuations is what signals it along with the movement. It's not just movement. Uh, yeah. Yes? Yeah, yeah, yeah you, can a lot do of stuff. A, you can do a lot of stuff like that. I think David Olin did it with, uh, with some scotch, so... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yep. I think Dave Kennedy did it with a vape. Yep. <laughs> but, so, yeah. Yeah, but the thing with the canned air is that it is cold enough. So, and some of the water, it could be colder water too. It just needs to have that different uh, temperature variance to trip the, the ones that read temperature fluctuations. Yep. So here's a, a quick video. This shows Tim and I uh, getting access from an external door through two internal doors into the, the target area that we were tasked with, with trying to access. Um, you'll see a few things here. Uh, Tim, you want to, let's see. Well, let me go ahead and say this, that this is, uh, this is, um, after we did it. Cause the client said, Hey, how did you guys do that? And we were like, Oh, well, we'll record a video for you. That way you can show your guys and now you know how. Yeah. So. Let's see. Let me go back. Uh, so this, uh, so this is where, uh, with a paper clip. So, uh, the magnetic, the magnetic locks, like slog, things like that. You can completely basically disable those by putting something up there like a paper clip. Uh, now, I will caution, obviously that looks awful. So if anyone's doing door checks or paying attention, why is a paper clip stuck to the door with tape? Uh, that's one good way to check incident response. Um, so you can see, I just pull the door right open. There's, there's no uh, resistance on that at all. Um, so, yeah, we'll watch the rest of this video real quick. Uh, can you hear that out there at all? Okay, that's all right. So uh, just basically on the other side of that door is another door uh, with a fingerprint reader and a badge reader. Uh, this door, like you have, to, you have to badge in to get to this door to badge in to get to a fingerprint reader to badge in, and then you're into the uh, target zone. So this is uh, the fingerprint reader here. Um, I do want to say... <laughs> Make sure you carry two straws with you with the canned air. <laughs> at least, um, at least two straws. This is pretty funny. <laughs> I'm doing it and I shoot the straw off, and I'm like, oh. Now he's trying it without the straw. He's, he's like, eh, that's he's not like, work. yeah, the straw came off. <laughs> See, the straw came off. <laughs> so this we is round two. It, paused it, put it on there, and that's just full disclosure. You know, we're not trying to go through and look like we do everything perfect. If we mess up, yeah. we're going to tell you we mess up. So. Yeah, and, and they're actually the video of uh, of coat hanger and uh, hand warmer, or uh, under the door tool and a hand warmer as well. Oh, just to grab the straw. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. When we when we actually opened this door, the straw was probably a good six yeah, feet away. I mean, it was it, it was it was far. gone. Then also be aware of chemical burns. Yeah. Um, yeah. When, when you use canned air, especially uh, turning that upside down, it's no fun when you get it yeah. on your skin. So, um, and then they just talked about that. So this was, uh, this is one of our, my favorite assessments to date when they, they were like, oh, we've just spent, a we've lot of spent money. so much money on all new access controls on this brand new, uh, data center. And we'll call it, we'll call it the super secure data center in Washington. And, uh, and so after we were told that we will not be able to get into there, this is us doing a video of me getting into a cage. So, uh, so we didn't have canned air this time, but we needed another temperature flux or variance, and then we also needed motion. So we used the under the door tool that was in my bag, and Brent had a hand warmer in his bag and a hack the planet bracelet. Yep. And uh, so if you watch the badge reader, right about there, it there green. it turns green. And thank you. Yay, we're inside. So, 
super easy. Yeah, so your gates and your fences, if you have requests for exit or anything like that, don't don't use those. That's defeats the purpose. Yeah, at least in a, such a small cage. Yep. Uh, yep. So we're talking about the like the shove bar. So if you're trying to attack these crash bars or put canned air in to trip the rec sensor, how do you stop those things? Well, the the reason you're able to do that is because there's a physical gap in the door. If you remove that gap or you cover that gap with an astragal, there's no way for those attacks to work anymore uh, unless somehow there's enough room to go under the door. But you can also put weather stripping and other things there that will help close those gaps. Now all those attacks you've just seen, they don't work except for this. So again, back to the magnetic locks. Uh, you can see that paper clip sticking out. It looks awful. One of the things, one of the reasons I carry gaffer's tape, do you remember the, the ink pen earlier where I had gaffer's tape wrapped around the top of it? So if you take a, a strip of gaffer's tape, just maybe three, four inches, uh, and as long as it's at least an inch wide, you can take that off, you can stick it up there, and it actually blends in really well. And the best thing about that is there's still resistance on the door. So when they come around and they do door checks and they pull on it, it's going to seem normal. But when you need access again, you just give it a good strong tug and you're in. So Also, some of the sensors, too, won't trip that that door is uh, open because it's so thin. They're, they're still receiving that signal that the door is closed on some of the monitoring uh, devices. Yep. Uh, so, again, tailgating, piggybacking, free entry. That's a thing we do all the time. Yes, question. Right. Yeah, you do need requests for exit. It's just the way. Well, the request for exit too is also just where you position it. But yeah, the mag lock. Uh, I, th I think it's just making sure you're actually checking the doors. Because what happens yeah. is people just some people don't even check doors at all. Yeah. You know, their guards will just walk around and they'll badge in and then they'll go back in or out of the building. So it's important that if you have guards that you're actually checking these doors, uh, pull on them, make sure there's no rubber, um, tape on the the latching mechanisms or or the magnetic lock. Yeah, it, there are alternatives to the, the exposed mag locks like that where they actually lock inside of the door frame. Mm -hmm. So once you open it, you, there's not really a way to disable the mag lock because it isn't exposed that, like that. So there are, uh, there are alternatives that are a bit more secure. Is there another hand, another question? Yes. yes. <laughs> That's a good question, but it's going to take a really long well, time to explain. I didn't want. So, uh, <laughs> I didn't want to eat. I didn't want to eat too much. So yeah. So yeah, it's all getting piggybacking. You know, just a friendly face, and you know, uh, use your 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 charisma, or uh, look busy. I mean, we're not going to get into this too much because a lot of our talks we talk about social engineering, and uh, you know, Jason did a good job covering that. But um, tailgating again, it's one of the top ways we, any of us get into buildings. Yeah, and that's just to, you know, to add on to what Jason was saying earlier, it's such an easy way to get in, a very common way. It's a natural hum a response for humans to want to help each other. And so unfortunately, when we have to think like bad guys, we have to exploit that, exploit people's kindness, which is an awful thing to say, but that's what that's what bad guys do. So, um, yeah. Nice person. <laughs> Stupid bad guys. So ways to prevent this, you know, uh, Jason had mentioned too, like just a big open floor plan that's monitored. Uh, that's pretty intimidating when you walk in, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then having a guard there that's actually doing their job. Uh, but there are man traps, security doors, there's other uh, man traps out there um, that help to uh, reduce piggybacking. Yeah, so some of the best, best uh, tailgating prevention systems that I've seen, uh, I'm not going to get too vendor specific, but I do want to mention one, uh, Boone Eatem. They make a really, really uh, high secure mechanism like this one. You see it's a turnstile, and it has this cool thing called stereo vision in it. And so when someone is walking in, it will sense if there is more than one person trying to go in at once, and so it will automatically lock you in that area. It also has detections that you can set to where if an individual is walking to this area and they've badged in, and they have an item that's in the shape of a weapon, it will also alert. Uh, so there's a lot of cool things that you can tweak, uh, pressure floor mats, things like that. So uh, there are ways to to work towards mitigating uh, tail uh, piggybacking, tailgating, whatever you want to call it. 
Uh, earlier, Jason mentioned seeing the, uh, the the pin like where they're rubbed off. It's been used a lot. Uh, you can tell which code. You can kind of let, narrow it down. Uh, this is a, a way that Brent and I like to do it sometimes is uh, just using a, a sharp or a highlighter to highlight the numbers and then before someone comes in, before it gets really busy, and then you can just go back and you can use the UV light to see uh, which pins or numbers they're pushing. That right. way you can kind of reduce the amount of guesses that you're aiming for. Yeah, so I, I've put a lot of, uh, of time sort of researching this. Now, there are certain pin pads like rubber pin pads and things where Sharpie is not the best medium to use. However, com it's pretty common that I've seen for garages, things like that, to have more weather resistant buttons such as plastic or metal. So if you use the Sharpies, and they have to be the older Sharpies that don't say smudge free. Um, so if it's just an old school or a really cheap Sharpie, then it gives you a good six to maybe eight, nine minutes before it dries, but it's plenty enough time uh, to run up and paint the pad, uh, clone someone's badge, and then go see what buttons they push. Again, as Jason mentioned, now we know at least the, the four buttons that were pushed to bring it down to what, a 21. Now we have 21 guesses for that. Um, so it's just a quick, quick, cheap way to try to, to decrease the amount of guesses you have to take with a pin pad. Um, Real quick shout out, Devian Olam, he's done a lot of research for things that are keyed the same. Uh, and so this is a sample uh, key kit that we use, uh, thanks to his recommendations. And so when you find things like door king access controls, you can buy the master key off of Amazon or any other place. So when you see a common door king access control, you just unlock it, you open it, and there's a postal service button that you push. And whatever door they have assigned to that will open. So, um, yeah. At least getting you through the first layer of physical, right. uh, that barrier. So what to look for when you get inside. Uh, you know, one of the things we like to look for are service elevators. Uh, they usually have unrestricted access. You know, you can get to, you can use fire keys. There are keys out there that you can use to bypass badge restricted um, uh, floors, but you know, some of the newer elevators uh, have different keys. You know, there's different sets out there. Um, but it's just easier to find a service elevator and uh, and use that. Oftentimes, yep. too, they don't have cameras for some reason. I don't know why that is, but it, uh, it is a common case. Yeah. My favorite thing about finding service elevators is that they're, they're often used by, you know, if there's some sort of a food crew or cleaning crew or something. It, the reason they use that other than the full access to all floors is that they are often back out of view of the public. So when you're using this, you're not right, you're not in the main lobby most of the time where it's easier to be noticed. You're back out of the way, um, so that you're not getting in the way. And so it's just, it's a good find. Also, if you're wearing like a maintenance outfit or something like that, then, you know, you're, it's more appropriate for you to fit in and no one's really going to question why you're, Entering the loading dock area and going to the service area. Yeah. Or a high vis vest. Right? There's so many you know, things. Padlocks. There's a lot of really bad ones. Um, there's some of them. <laughs> master lock is not the master of much. Yeah, does anybody notice the theme with our pictures up there? Yeah. yeah. So uh, there's several ways to bypass these, you know, shims, uh, things like that. We usually carry a handful of, of uh, shims on us in case we can't um, pick the lock or, or something or have a harder time. If it's a combination lock, this is easy to bypass combination locks um, with, with a shim. Uh, if they've got the hook on both sides, or the teeth on both sides, you can use two shims. Right. Um, some of them, you know, there's a lot of good locks out there too. So mm -hmm. just make sure that when you're, um, when you're getting padlocks, don't, don't go to Walmart and just buy the master locks in the hardware section. Yeah, if you really want to protect it, yeah. and, you know, don't do that. Um, and there's, there's even one you can Google, I'm not going to point it out, but there's one on here that you can open simply by hitting it in the right spot with a hammer. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah, if you guys go to any lock picking village at any hacker con, you're going to see a bunch of these locks. Why are they there? Just because they're, they're pretty easy to pick and that's usually where you can get started. So. Yeah, it's beginner locks. Yeah. Uh, and if you whisper gently to one, that'll open as well. <laughs> <laughs> so we like to look for, uh, hinge pins. A lot of times in commercial settings with the proper doors, this isn't really something you see a lot. However, there are times where um, we've been on commercial 
style sites like warehouses, things like that, where they just want a quick entry door and they expose the hinge pins externally. So you don't need to unlock the door when you can just take the door off. It's amazing too when the client does you know, rent something like that property management um, assessment I did. Some of their doors, they had the hinge pins outside, but they had, uh, <laughs> they had, uh, retinal scanners. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, man, you spent a lot of money to put that, that fancy, uh, eyeball reader there. You know, yeah. like, <laughs> Let me use my $10 tool. <laughs> yeah. So the Bangit is a, is a handy little tool, yep. um, that just, you know, you can just whack it real, uh, real hard with a, a, a hammer or whatever. You're not going to carry a hammer on you, but you can pick, a lot of different things to just like a bump hammer. Yeah, bump hammer we for use bump that. keys um, that actually works with it too. Yeah, so it just knocks the pin up pretty easily. Um, a quick fix for that if your hinge pins are exposed and there's not really a way to mitigate that, what you can do is buy these really cheap things called uh, security pins, like the the door hinge security pins. So you take one screw out on one side, one screw out on the other side, uh, leave that hole open, and on the other side you put this guy in. So now when the door is closed, this actually goes into that. So even if I take those those hinge pins off, I can't lift that door up now because it's stuck into place. Yeah, so. And they're pretty cheap too. Yeah. It's, it's a cheap uh, remediation. So uh, keys, fun story. Uh, Brent and I got into a security uh, control room, uh, picked their, they had a like a wafer style lock on an aluminum box that housed their keys. Um, so we were able to pick that really quick. Um, we got in there and then we were doing an assessment at a different data center um, a couple days after. Uh, it's the same client, different location. Uh, when we were in there, we're like, holy crap, look at this key. And they marked it and it said XYZ data center. And I was like, huh. And so we took a picture of it. We went to Lowe's, we bought a file, a key, a blank key, and we played arts and crafts in our hotel room lobby for for a while and it worked. Yeah, um, Drew, uh, Drew Culbertson helped with that yeah, one too. Yeah. So don't take uh, don't take pictures of your keys either and put them online because of stuff like this because that's exactly what we did. We just took different angles, got close, we measured it, all this stuff. Uh, very highly technical. Um, <laughs> Arts and crafts. <laughs> but there are also on-site field duplicator kits out there too where you can actually duplicate the key uh, while you're there. Yeah. Um, Badge emulation. Uh, Sometimes you don't have to clone a badge. There's been several times where we've just seen what they look like, go back to the hotel, craft something up in Photoshop or your image editor of choice, and print it off. We've even had a guy that we know that got access to a pretty secure area with just a piece of paper that he drew on with some random thing with a red crayon. Yeah, I got some random marks. I got access to a health, uh, it was like a health processing place and. Uh, Got inside, I found one of their letterheads, and I had a, a sleeve for a, a badge, an HID badge. I found one of their letterheads, like their envelope that had their logo on it. I cut that up, and I cut another thing, and I made a, made a badge just by cutting and putting layers of, of their stuff on it. Yeah, you did that while you were inside of the... Yeah, I did it inside. I did it in a conference room while I was setting up an access point to make sure they could read it from the parking lot, and I was just sitting there cutting it out. I locked the door to make my own office, so it was pretty fun. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah, if you can find a conference center or a conference room or an office you can get into, it's pretty cool Go in there and you just lock the door, you plug into the network and you do whatever. And then when someone starts knocking, they're like, one second, I'm changing or something like that. You know, just, okay, come back. Uh, there's a lot of different ways you can, you can do that. Uh, badge cloning, we do a lot of badge cloning as well. Uh, some clients like to know, hey, is our badge easy to clone or replicate? Uh, and most of the times it is because people go with the stock HID badges. Um, you can use several different things to do this. Uh, our favorite is just the Proxmark. There's a couple, of the, there's newer versions of this, but the Proxmark 3 and the Proxmark 3 Easy is kind of our defaults. Um, we usually set one to low frequency and one to high frequency. Uh, there's different ways to do this. There's toggle pins. You can have the same, uh, the same rep, or a beat reader. Um, replay and stuff, you can set it to low or high and just toggle that. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is just kind of our setup. And I uh, want to point, go back real quick. So this this is from DangerousThings.com. It's a little wallet size RFID uh, checker. And so when we are not sure if someone's badge reader is in set to low or high frequency, you can walk up to it with this and it will flash and tell you if it's low or high frequency. It just fits so. in your wallet too, and it's a little powered thing, and it'll yeah. glow whether it's low frequency or high frequency. Yeah. It's a neat little tool. 
So um, one of the things we love to do uh, with clipboards, we like to, uh, I guess, weaponize them, if that's still the cool term to use. But we basically put badge cloners in there. This is my cheap, quick setup. You can tell uh, I took the Proxmark. I just uh, used some gaffer's tape to fix the antennas and the device and then a battery inside. Uh, and, of course, on the top, I'll, I'll lay papers on top of it, like, you know, some print to make it look like it's something legitimate for whatever the case is. Uh, yeah, one of the things I like to do is uh, inventory. So I'm doing an inventory of, I'm getting the serial numbers off of the servers uh, for different things. I walked up to a security guard and was like, went over to the security system and I started writing stuff down. He didn't really, he was like, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, we're just taking inventory because we're going to replace these later. Um, just need to get the serial number. And then we had a conversation, established a report, and he let me into the data center later. But um, using the clipboard is, is a handy prop. Uh, this is a fancier, older version. Uh, yeah, this is Tim's. Of my covert clipboard. Fancy schmancy. Yeah. So I've just got a pie in there. I've got a few different antennas on the top there, and I've also got the Proxmark there. And he can watch Netflix um, with it, too. I, I think. can. I got a wireless... Uh, <laughs> Wireless USB that you can SSH into, so you can uh, somebody else can just as you're sitting there uh, reading badges, they can clone them from the car or something. I like the wave at the end. <laughs> Hi, mom. So this is actually one of my favorite. Yeah, I love uh, this one. This is great. Favorite stories. Uh, Brent and I. Um, it was a really highly secured facility, um, and we knew it was going to be hard to get into there because we had done an assessment there a couple of years. Before. We also knew that some of the people there watch our DEF CON talks and such. And um, We found so, that out during. Yeah, during, which is funny. Because they let us in, we tailgated, and we're going. They're like, they turned around, they're like, wait a minute. I'm like, aren't you Tim and Brent? Yeah, like, uh, no? I, saw, I was like, uh, <laughs> why? I was like, I saw your talk at DEF CON. Yeah. And it was like, are you social engineering? Yeah, this? I, no. Yeah, like, are, and they said, are you, are you doing an assessment against us right now? And we're like, no, man, we're just here to meet with whoever. And I was like, Okay, I'm going to keep my I'm eye on keep you. My, we're like, all right. It's like, all right, while, while you're keeping your eye on us, we're going to go sit in here in this conference room while we're waiting for so-and-so. So I was like, I, he's, his desk is I right outside. I plug up my laptop. I start running some Yeah, we both, we, I unplug the phone, so I get that network access. Tim plugs directly into the wall. So we're both sitting there with our laptops that both have, this, this is the laptop. It's got hacker stickers all over it. And we're facing the dude, so he sees the back of the laptop. And he's just sitting there looking at us and talking like whatever he's talking about to his coworkers. So I, you know, make a, a fake phone call. It's like, oh, that sucks. You're not going to be able to make it. All right. All right. We'll meet you at the other place. And I'm like, hey, man, so and so can't make it. Uh, sorry to bother you guys. We'll see you later. And then we, yeah. He's like, all right, guys. That's great. So yeah. So anyway. yeah, we walked out of there with some, some information. And yeah. It was fun. All right. So, uh, well, so but real quick on this, uh, this guy here, how did we get into the building? Um, Brent and I had set those um, badge readers. We shoved them in a coffee cup and we shoved them in a muffin bag. Um, and then we went out Works back where so people good. were uh, smoking. We hung out, um, pretend to be smokers as well, which, you know, there are still some smoking areas. Some places there's not anymore, mm -hmm. but uh, this place fortunately had one. And we went over and the guy had a, uh, a lanyard and it was the same color as mine. It looked like from a conference. And I had my coffee cup and I was like, hey, man, you've got that same, kind yeah. of same lanyard. Yeah, and I had my muffin bag, and I was like, oh, so yeah, I'm got, like so, <laughs> so we're, so we both cloned his badge, and yeah. then we waited for him to go in. We just went to the front door and yeah. entered using his badge to go to the front but door as he went into the back door. Which the the hilarious. funniest part about that was as you go in the main door, there was the guard station right there and with the glass and th where they can be conscious of who's coming and going. So the employee uses his badge. Tim badges in with his coffee cup, and then I badge him with my muffin bag. So, and you know, get, Jason was saying this earlier, too, anything. you know, the female name, right? You, you, there's a dude here, and there's a, a female name that just popped up using that badge. It's the same thing. If the guy's badging in three times in a row, it's probably a, there's something going on there, yeah, right? Something's Because uh, we use that same badge to badge in across the facility, and he yep. went upstairs. We went downstairs. We got in the data center using his badge. Was, yeah. So this is uh, one of my toys that I like. This is uh, kind of a long long-range, low-frequency cloner. Uh, kind of a big footprint, so you need a decent-sized backpack for it. But it's cool. I can set it up somewhere, clone badges, connect to it wirelessly, and see what I have, uh, and then use a smaller Proxmark to write that badge. Uh, so, and if you've seen a Mr. Robot, too, that's, that's what they use in the coffee shop there. Um, so this is a... I actually got this from a security guard. Um, 
walked up to the security guard, was just making co friendly conversation. Brent was talking to him, distracting him, and I cloned his badge, and then I got through uh, through the little yeah, so glass he, man trap using the security guard's badge, which is handy. Yeah. Security guard badges are great to replicate because they have access to everything. everything. Yeah. <laughs> so, so Tim is holding the badge cloner in his hand like this, and he's talking to the security guard. Look over here, and they said, this is the guard's badge, and he's like, he's talking "Yeah, to man," he's, and he's getting it set, sitting there like pushing the button. He doesn't and stuff. know what I'm doing. I, I was just because we we're trying at this point to get caught. And, uh, and we're like, let's go to the yeah. security guard. So he's doing this. His badge. And while he's talking to the guy looking at him, he just does that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Clueless. He didn't even, I don't think he even noticed yeah. Tim just put his hand up to him. Oh, yeah, it was amazing. It's awesome. Uh, there's different uh, little things you can do too. Uh, for example, the garage readers. Um, this is what actually Brent built his, uh, his Proxmark into to, to get that higher, that bigger antenna. But the garage readers here, uh, you can, Use a bleed key, you can use the ESP key. Uh, these are things that you just plug in, uh, little vampire clips, uh, plug in there and you can Bluetooth into it and you can replay, um, as people badge in and out, you can replay their badges uh, via Bluetooth. Yeah, and they have a, a mobile app too, which is super handy. Yeah. So you just as you walk up to it, you just pick what badge you want to replay and it, you're, you're in. So we're going to speed through the rest of this yeah, I think here. We're running close uh, on time. So, yeah, USB attacks. Don't expose these things where anybody can walk up and just plug something into it. This was from a, a pretty large place. They were remodeling, so, uh, so excuse our mess. I'm just like, okay, thanks for the freebie there. Uh, don't do this. If you don't need USB ports on your systems, disable them. Physically block them or just disable them. Here's some of the, you know, attacks you can use. Um... You know, whatever Hack Five comes up with their verbiage yeah. for naming their tools. We gave them later, some name though. options there at the bottom if if, <laughs> if Darren wants to use any of those. Uh, <laughs> so one of my favorite tools too. It's uh, it's basically the uh, rubber ducky, but it has a wireless access point into it, uh, built into it. So you plug that in, and there's a really cool mobile app. And these things are super cheap. So once you plug it in, I connect to the access point on this thing. And I inject whatever commands I want directly into that system. It's really cool. Disguising your um, USBs too, uh, like this Galleon turtle putting yeah. some tape on it. it says "Do not remove." Yeah. Do you notice a, a theme there? So you see that. Uh, and then on this next one, speed test, do not remove. All of my all of my devices that I drop, I I put that on there in big yellow tape because I don't want somebody saying, like, "Well, I'm not touching." Even that, thing. that old school uh, case yeah. there. Uh, the the poem plug years ago had you know we we still use that case like sometimes because it's uh people don't really question it yep unless you've got your don't don't you what I'm saying is don't use a Raspberry Pi with a clear case and all your hacker stickers and antennas sticking all over it no oops oops so another thing to look for that's the top of my head because Tim's a lot taller than I am taking a picture. <laughs> Uh, that, we have, we're in the, we're in the server room and they had their camera system there. So why not, you know, disable the cameras for a bit? Uh, or whatever else we wanted to do with that particular system. And this other side is funny. I got into a human resource at like a dimple lock. I was able to pick it and uh, get into where they store uh, employee records. And they kept the social security numbers on the top of the, the things with the names. So it would be yeah. like, like street, Jason, and then his social what, security number. That's social? how they organized everything. <laughs> so, I did, <laughs> exactly. so I took a picture of that, and then I had like, I don't know how many identities in one picture. Um, it was kind of ridiculous. Yeah, is that the one, or was it a different one where you, our point of contact, you actually pulled his It was his, yeah. I found the point of contact's employee record, uh, and I, I, I stole it. And then I, uh, I went to his office where he wasn't there. We got into his office, and I laid his... His, uh, his employee record on his desk with a post-it that said, here you go, in our card. Um, which later on, he said, man, I can't see that. Yeah, I can't look at my, he goes, you I guys are going to get me in trouble. Yeah. So. Uh, this is a funny one, too. They, so we had been in this place for a while, and this is Tim on top of a vending machine with his head in the ceiling. To the right, uh, right here, was the entrance uh, for the cafeteria. This was at lunchtime. People were going in and out for lunch. No one stopped and said, hey, why is that guy on top of the vending machine with his head in the roof? And why was I doing it? Because in front of me is the data center. They didn't have uh, a firewall or floor-to-ceiling. Yeah, and so I was able to right crawl over. over it. 
Um, you know, our, again, your shredder bins don't have crappy shredder bins. Yeah, we uh, we have this game we play where we stick our hands in there and pull it out, and it's called shredder bin bingo. So whoever whoever gets the coolest document wins, and the other person buys them a beer or something yeah. later. So uh, unlocked fine. workstations, we always look for this stuff. You know, if it's already unlocked, then you know, thanks for the help. You guys have done us a yeah, solid. It's kind of hard to see this, but this was uh, this was left unlocked, and it was on uh, product price management. So that that could have been leaving cool. keys in your server racks yeah. that you're trying to restrict and keeping uh, ladders in there for us because this is funny because if you look at the top where they run the yeah. cable, uh, this is segmented because it's two different um, companies. I fit through there just yeah. FYI. Yeah. <laughs> stay out, yeah. If, <laughs> if you want somebody to stay out of something, don't put that on there because yeah. then they're going to go in there. Yeah. So what was in there was a bunch of keys to desk. Yeah, <laughs> in an unlocked. And I was like, drawer. I have to take a picture yeah. of this. So, uh, Jason mentioned this too: post-its and writing your password underneath your keyboards. You know, yeah, it, it, we see this all the time. Yeah. I'm just, all the time, all the time, and it's ridiculous. We also see. Yeah, but wait, there's more. These. Yes. Um, I have I have seen probably, I've I don't know, I've seen probably ten of these in Burn the them. last few years. Because, you know, Target and stuff, they sell these things. And, and it's actually littered, uh, like titled, you know, your password logbook. Yeah, passwords. Yeah, don't use those. Uh, just to speed through this, because I know we're kind of running over a little bit, um, you know, a couple different assessments where you just establish that rapport, you get close to them, you get nice with them, uh, you tell them that you're, like this security guard that I'm making laugh, uh, Brent and I went up there, yeah, those I are pretended my hands. to be an auditor, Brent was uh, one of the guys from another office who was uh, a manager, um, and he was escorting me as a contractor there doing a NIST assessment. He's wearing and a suit. And I was wondering how they handled their badges, their one-day badges and such. And she began to explain to me. And I said, oh, do you have these badges? Are these badges active? Yes, here's a whole binder full. Yeah, and mean, then they give me like a binder full of badges, and I've got yeah. my clipboard there, and we like, copied like 50. Like, Tim, once you go around there and sit, it looks like it's going to take you a while. Yeah. So he's sitting behind the desk next to the guard, Putting these on top of his uh, clipboard cloner. Yeah. She didn't say anything. He would pull one out, and uh, it's plastic, and so the card's plastic, and to read it, he would lay it on there and, like, kind of go like this, sure and it was like, reading it. you know, making a noise, like, <laughs> and she never thought, okay, why is this guy rubbing all the cards on his clipboard and then putting them back in? Uh, this, so. too, like, uh, this lady was super nice. Uh, she had a, a picture of uh, her daughter or granddaughter playing soccer, and Brent began to talk to her about, um, you know, the soccer game and their kids and stuff. And while they did, I said, hey, I'm doing a network uh, assessment test. Um, I just need to get access to your system. I asked her to lock her system. I plugged in a key logger. Then I said, actually, you know, I need to check one thing. Could you log back in? And then she logged back in. I said, okay, thanks. Then Brent continues talking to her, and now I've got her domain, username, password. Your and text. then I was like... Uh, all right, I think we're wrapped up. I need to get your name first because your name, your name spelt weird. I was like, can I see your badge so that I can write it down? Because it was a long name. It was a mouthful. And she was like, oh, sure. Gave me her badge and we cloned her badge and wrote it down. Yeah. I felt so awful because... He did. He felt so bad after that. Yeah. I said. He was like, man, I feel, I got I so gotta I to find her after this and apologize to her. <laughs> so, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Tim's a jerk. <laughs> Yeah, clean desk policy again. Into some things Jason talked about earlier. Yeah, don't baseline yeah, configuration. Don't hide. Password management is not a post-it. So uh, you do the security awareness training. If you do, if you lead your security uh, by checkbox, you're doing it wrong. Stop. Just because you want to be compliant doesn't mean that you're secure. Just because you've met some standards doesn't mean you're secure. Just because you do a annual security awareness training with a few questions at the end of your fancy uh, slideshow doesn't mean you're secure. And it certainly doesn't mean that the employees that are taking that are going to retain that information and apply it. So this is where security culture needs to take place and it needs to over uh, take precedence over security awareness training. Now, uh, check checkbox security, that's a good baseline, it's a good start. You obviously need that, but consider real world scenarios actually push it to the limits, put more budget to that. So. This is this is from Google, but you'd be surprised how many times we've seen really stupid stuff like this. Uh, you know, don't leave gaps under your door. You know, you guys can read this. I know we're running out of time, and we're here at our last slide. Uh, but yeah, if you guys have any questions or anything uh, you'd like to talk to us, uh, feel free to meet us after in the in the hallway, uh, or just follow us. On
Zanshin Hacks on uh, on Twitter or Brent W Design uh, or just NTTSecurity.com. Cool. Yeah. Thank you guys. Thank you guys. Thank you.